Hi booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent release for four books. Wolfgang Hilbig, The Females, translated by Isabel Fargo Cole. The Night by Venezuelan author Rodrigo Blanco Calderon, translated by Noel Hernandez Gonzalez and Daniel Hahn. Uh, William Gaddis, J.R. And Evan Dara, The Easy Chain. So I'm going to start with the Hilbig. Uh, he's an East German, or he was an East German author. Uh, I hadn't heard of him. This is my second after the excellent Old Reddering Plant, which is five stars. And I have to say, this is not only five stars. I think it's even more superior than, than Old Reddering Plant. I've got a third of his books. Um, they're all being uh, translated and published by um, Two Lines Press. And they're all this sort of length, you know, between 100 and 120 pages, which makes them a very quick read. Um, so this is about uh, an East German man, and it starts off with him describing his own stink as he's working in a factory. And he's, his sort of skin is all sort of pustulated and unhealthy. And he's, he's completely alienated from, from himself, you know, with his sort of diseased skin and stuff. And uh, he is so sort of offensive uh, in appearance and smell to his work colleagues that he's given a, a, a job down in the basement repairing um, machines uh, where, you know, he won't disturb anybody else. But he can look up from this basement up to a sort of a, a, a narrow gap in a grill and he can see the floor above, which is a sort of heavy mould casting area which is worked by women powerful you know muscular women in their sort of um you know factory issued uniforms and it, it it's quite erotic as it's described it has an erotic effect on this guy as he's sort of you know perving and voyeuring up up on them um but eventually he loses his job and not for, he's not caught sort of voyeuring but he loses his job for basically getting into the face of a work colleague and as he sort of tramps around the town it's sort of at a loose end uh, he realizes that all the women seem to have disappeared from the town although is it more a case of he's become invisible to women rather than women have become invisible to him because part of what this book about is about is about a quest for his mother to get her to acknowledge his existence because when he was young he turned around to her in the family home and said that he was going to become a writer now don't forget this is east germany communist east germany and his mother is actually appalled by the prospect not only is it easy to fall proud of the authorities by writing stuff that they don't approve of but her greater concern is that he's going to reveal family secrets he's going to let cat, the cat out the bag and put their lives on on show you know as he uses the material of his his family for his books so ever since then he's felt sort of pushed away by his mother and he's you know he's desperately trying to get her to to acknowledge his existence and this is this is the thing this comes back to right at the beginning and his sort of stink and smell and all this sort of you know bad skin because the book is a search for the I the the, the first person singular because in East Germany there was no I there was no individual you know, you were part of a, a you know, of a, a, a proletariat, you know, a, a mass society. Um, and that by wanting to be a writer, by wanting to express himself, um, he's very much standing out against that. And that is why it's not his skin that is bad, although that is a symptom. It's his language that is bad in terms of how the state would see his ideas and his language. And he goes on this quest trying to sort of find out what's happened to the women in the town but also by doing that he's going to journey towards himself and it's brilliantly done and it's it really makes you think about gender in very unusual ways i mean i think it is specific to uh life under state socialism you know it's not something you can necessarily the analysis of gender in here is not something you can necessarily take into where we're at today with gender you know, there is cross-dressing themes that, that he experiments with, you know, maybe trying to become uh, a woman in his own right. Um, it's really interesting and it's really well done. And it's 120 pages packed with ideas and good writing and stuff. So five stars. And Onto the Night uh, by Rodrigo Blanco Calderon. 
Um, I saw Eric uh, Carl Anderson haul this and it sounded right up my street. And having read it, it's sort of a book that goes in two different directions at once. And each direction I really liked, but coming together, I couldn't quite make it work. So I give it four stars. And the two directions are, one, it is quite sort of postmodern uh, ab about sort of writing and stuff, whereby two of the main characters, one is an author and the other is a psychiatrist. And uh, the author uh, is, is a client of the psychiatrist. But at some point he turns around and asks the psychiatrist if he's ever written himself. And the psychiatrist sort of says, yeah, I've dabbled. So they switch positions and the psychiatrist starts to attend the author's um, writing classes, uh, which I think is a really nice, a nice uh, switch. And in the writing classes, amongst the others, are two other people. One is an author who, uh, at a young age, won a prestigious short story competition with a piece that no one could understand and it split the judges but half of the judges thought that you know this was genius and the other half thought it was a prank it was a wind up so it caused a lot of controversy but he got over the line he won it but then there was so much controversy in the press around it afterwards and people asking what it meant and stuff that he retreated from public life and didn't write anything for a long long time um, and then he started to come back to writing and he started to come back to writing first by analysing his own story to see, you know, what the hell was it about? Uh, and he realises that even if it was a prank, even if it was a sort of intellectual exercise, it's still representative of him because it came from him. It came from his experience. It was informed by his view on language and life, even if he wasn't consciously and actively putting them in there. But he's attending this workshop to get back into the swing of writing and the other person is a young woman um, who she and he uh, she and, the, and this other writer uh, have a relationship so those are the four main characters and there's a lot of stuff because as he analyzes his original story he realizes that anagrams and, pa and um, palindromes are very important um, and he tracks down the work of a, a, a Venezuelan, originally a painter, but he went on to write books, which are, again, very much steeped in using palindromes and anagrams and, and things like that. Um, so that's that's the first third of the book. Really promising, really interesting, lots of interesting ideas about writing and language uh, and stuff like that. And then part two is basically uh oh, sorry i want to say that part one reminded me a bit of uh, mac and his problems that novel i'd say that the setup for this was more interesting than the one in mac and his problems but it's not developed because we move on to part two which is a history of uh, modern venezuela pre chavez um and in that respect it reminded me of a colombian novel that was on the international book uh, list long list a couple of years ago uh, by uh, somebody Vasquez called uh, The Shape of the Ruins because that book was mainly about pre-narco um, Colombia. It was a history of, of sort of Colombia and, and this does the same for Venezuela and it's interesting in its own right because I don't know much about Venezuela. And it's about the revolutionaries and the communists, those forced into exiles by clamp down. Um, and one of the main through characters through that is this author who used palindromes and, and, and anagrams that the writer from part one was really up. So in a way, it's sort of the story of this guy's life and everyone that he came into contact with because he was part of this exile community and, you know, resistance, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et but there are an awful lot of characters passing, you know, you, you just sort of begin to learn about one character and the baton's passed on to somebody else who comes into that sphere. It's slightly overwhelming in terms of, of, of the characters that you have to deal with. Um, you know, I got a lot out of it. I learned about Venezuela, but I could, I was struggling to tie it back into part one. And then part three, it sort of returns to part part one and there's another character introduced which is um a a psychiatrist uh not the one from part one but uh, another psychiatrist based on a real life venezuelan figure who is uh chavez's uh ad main advisor really and in real life and in here this psychiatrist was found to be uh someone who kidnapped women you know his some of his female clients 
and um, you know basically imprisoned them and, and ended up killing them. And the real life guy, Shevers's uh, advisor, was actually jailed for it. Um, so that's in here as well. And it's I think it does say things about the link between writing and psychiatrists because they're very heavily populating the movement of resistance, the you know the the revolutionaries and the the you know the far left sort of activists and stuff. But I did find it hard to knit it all together. It seemed to be two different books, really. That's why I gave it four stars. And on to J.R. by William Gaddis. So this was my March of the Mammoths, because it comes in at 770 pages. Uh, it was a buddy read with Fraser over at A Springboard for Thought. Um, I'm going to put uh, in the notes below, I'll publish the link to Fraser's very good uh, summation of, of this. And also to Chris Veer over at Leaf by Leaf who has a 40, 50 minute long uh, video talking about this. Um, so JR is an 11 year old schoolboy. I think that makes him sixth grade in America. Forgive me, American cousins, if I've got that wrong. And he and his mate, uh, they, they send away for anything free that's in the back of magazine, you know, comic books and, and magazines and stuff. So they get free samples, they get gifts, they get, um, company reports, anything that's free, and they have this little massive mail stuff that arrives. And they sift through, and they weed out what's going to be useful to him. But Jr. has one particular focus that the other guy doesn't have. Jr. after a trip to Wall Street, a school trip to Wall Street, uh, is interested in in anything to do with business. Hence things like company reports and, and things like that. And on the trip to Wall Street, uh, the class have all brought, brought in a, a few cents. And collectively, they bought one share in a company. And JR uses this as a springboard to trade up. Um, you know, he buys penny stocks. Um, and he basically um, sequesters uh, a what we'd call a supply teacher here in the UK. So there's a, a musician who, to earn a bit of cash on the side, uh, is teaching at the school. He's supporting uh, the music teacher there. Uh, as they're putting on a production of uh, Wagner. And this kid, JR, is part of the cast, but he's completely uninterested in it. You know, he's only interested in making money. And he somehow sequesters this teacher to, because the, he lends the teacher money after a mix up over the train tickets for a field trip. He's sort of got him under his thumb. And in the end, most of the characters in this book end up working for JR. No one knows, apart from the teacher, no one knows that he's this 11 year old kid. When he, you know, he gets a phone booth installed in the school as part of his, you know, his sort of uh, wheeling and dealing. And any time he's on the phone talking to grown ups, he stuffs initially paper and then a handkerchief to disguise his voice because they tell him he's, he's a kid. So JR is sort of a wheeler dealer. And everyone falls under his thumb because, you know, they they're making money and uh it's it's worth being a part of and we get all these subsidiary characters you know every aspect of capitalism i mean this is a tour de force of capitalism in america by the early 70s when this book came out so not only stocks and shares and mergers and acquisitions you get uh inheritance you know from wills uh, you get insurance claims, you get gambling, you get lending someone money for a train or a taxi fare. You know, every aspect that money and transactions permeates is in here. The book is almost entirely in dialogue, uh, non-attributed, but it's so skillfully done that you know who is talking. But it does make it, you know, it demands your attention. You have to keep your focus to realise who's talking and stuff. And when it's on this few occasions when it's not uh, dialogue, when it's description, they're run on sentences. Those paragraphs teeter like they're going to collapse under their own weight because this empire that JR is building is teetering on the point of collapse as well. One of the main characters is, is the chief broker uh, of, at a you know investment company handling stocks and shares. And he reels off deals going down here, there and everywhere, bits of information that would feed into deals such as, you know, this guy, you know, the, the CEO here is in hospital having a kidney, you know, whatever it is. He talks like a ticker tape machine. 
he is non-stop and his, his grasp of detail, which he needs to make all these right decisions about buying and selling shares, is extraordinary. But it's hard to read. It is, in a way, it's anti-art because it's only concerned with commerce and business. So there's all this facts and data being thrown at you, written as facts and data, not written as art, which is really an interesting embodiment of the thing that this book is about. Because there are artists in here, including the musician who swept up in JR's empire, but there are other artists. And they're all they're all forced, they're all sucked into the into the system of commerce. They can't be pure artists, arts for art's sake. So there's a there's a an uptown apartment here where uh, first a musician and then another writer I've been given a permission to go there as a sort of a writing retreat or a you know an artistic retreat to, to write and to compose and it's absolute bedlam and chaos in there you know the, the tap breaks so there's water constantly uh, you know flooding the place there's all the mail from JR is directed there the phone's constantly going because JR set up a line there um, Deliveries go to there, and JR is wheeling and dealing on all these, you know, buying up bankrupt stock of, of things. So it's absolute bedlam, and these artists cannot escape. They, you know, they need peace at the centre in order to create, and that's the one thing they are denied. Commerce is anti-art, both sort of intellectually and artistically, but also in terms of commerce. You know, they're, they're frustrated at every turn, these artists. It's brilliantly done. As I say, it is it is quite hard going, particularly in the in the middle section where you've you've got the shtick from part one. Part three resolves a lot of the stuff, which you know, from a plot and a a fate of various characters' point of view, which is very worthwhile. But part two, I feel, doesn't really advance anything that part one hasn't already. It's more of the same, really. And um, for example, as I say, the broker reading his stuff is anti-art. One of the frustrated artists, the writer. Basically, he's a drunk and he's very, very belligerent um, and very unpleasant. No, no less unpleasant than the broker is. And, you know, the broker is at the top of the pile, giving orders, squashing underlings. And this guy, the writer, he has no power over other people, but he has a very similar um, sort of timbre of voice in that he's just because he's a drunkard. That he's just sort of berating people and using people and ignoring people and that's quite hard going you know the, these two fairly significant characters are not are not great and then the final thing i'd like to say you know it's written in the early 70s but there's there's sort of nods at things that developments that were going you know that we have come to know in our lifetimes um although technically in 1972 i was eight so <laughs> it's even then it was in my lifetime, but I wasn't reading this at age eight. So, for example, you know, another aspect of uh, the money uh, and penetration of capitalism is corrupt deals with um, local government. Here we have a school board trying to put a budget together. Uh, and there's lots of sort of corruption, you know, between them and, and the local government. Um, but one of the things one of them says during the budget meeting is that, you know, we need reinforced strength glass. Uh, and it really made me think because, of course, this is pre school shootings. So now you don't need reinforced strength glass, you need bulletproof glass. And I think, you know, sort of in a way, Gaddis was sort of pointing at that. Another thing is, uh, one of the brokers is a hunter. He loves going hunting on the continent of Africa. But he's very worried that the poverty of Africa is going to wreck his hunting uh, because the, the infrastructure isn't there. So he's trying to agitate for. Uh, legislators to bring over all these endangered animals to Florida and to set up hunting parks in Florida. Well, that sort of hasn't happened, but a version of that's happened where you get sort of hunting tourism where, you know, these sort of that, that outcry of that Minnesotan dentist who went over to Zimbabwe and shot a, you know, a treasured 20 year old lion or whatever it was and the outcry that that caused. So again, there's an element of, you know, future prediction which I, I found quite impressive so all in all you know a very very good read four and a half stars and weirdly the I picked up the hill big when I finished JR because it's short it, I read it in a day so the next book I picked up i.e the second book after JR 
was this, The Easy Chain by uh, Evan Dara. And it's very, very similar in theme. Um, although being Evan Dara, it has an ecological tinge, which apart from the hunting thing, wasn't so much in JR. I mean, it's it treads very similar ground with a very similar tone. Um, Evan Dara is a bit of a sort of unknown quantity. He's sort of, you can't say it's self-publishing. He has his own publishing house called Aurora. He lives in Paris, but no one really, you know, he doesn't do sort of, you know, appearances and events and stuff. But the critic Stephen Moore reached out to him. Stephen Moore is a big Gaddis uh, uh, critic. And um, he th uh, uh, Dara's first book called The Lost Scrapper, which I recommend for anyone, by the way, although it is very difficult to get hold of outside of the US. Anyway, um, because that was all told in dialogue, unattributed, no, no clear transitions, very similar to the way this is written and chunks of the recognitions uh, by Gallus is also written. Stephen Moore asked, asked Dara, you know, if, if Gallus was an influence on him. And Dara's response, and you take this or leave this, was that he got a copy of one of the Gallus' books out of the library, read the first page and then closed it, didn't go back to it because he was afraid of being influenced by it. OK, I can buy that. And let's face it, the coincidence of unattributed all dialogue style, you know, is is that that can be coincidental. But to pick a similar theme, this was published in 2003, so 30 years later. Um, I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure I buy buy Dara's uh, disclaimer on that. So this is very much capitalism 20 years after JR, I feel. Um, and again, it's it's told all in dialogue. So the very first part is it's a litany of people giving voice about this character called Lincoln Selwyn. And we get the history of Lincoln Selwyn through these characters. It's not Lincoln Selwyn ever talking about himself in the beginning. And Lincoln Selwyn uh, had British parents but grew up in Amsterdam. But he had this yearning to attend the University of Chicago uh, and study on their Humanities and Civilizations course. And from that to get into a uh, elite club of 100. Um, I can't remember exactly the ins and outs of it. But that, that was his dream. And he manages to get, you know, even though he's a mature student and doesn't have the uh, qualifications, that's right, he manages to get into the UC to do this. But he's struggling as a student. And he's sort of depressed and, and, and stuff. But he's pulled out of the mire because someone offers him a job uh, in an estate agency, or realtors, as Americans call it. And he's brilliant. Even though he's not formally allowed, because he hasn't got the qualifications, he's not formally allowed to close deals. He takes people up to the point at which someone else comes and closes. And he's so good. He's so charming. He's so winning that he, you know, he's that the, the business just, you know, takes off. Um, and from there, he gets a job in a bank. Uh, sort of, you know, people come to him uh, looking for, you know, investment from the bank. And we get a lot of these sort of crackpot people with their pitches to him. And he never says anything. We only get it from their point of view. They, they, they're sort of hoist by their own petards, by their own ridiculousness. Um, so that is part one. It's a very light touch, but detailed introduction to this character and then he disappears from Chicago no one knows where he's gone there seem to be all these accusations that you know he did everything for free and everyone else had to pick up the tab he's left a lot of unpaid bills behind and um, uh, the Treasury US Treasury Department are after him but they think he's gone back to Holland um, so they you know they have limited uh, you know reach over there um when he was in chicago he paid a private investigator to search out his aunt who, who sort of you know dropped off the face of the earth and his aunt was being his mother's sister now back in holland he's doing similar looking for his mother who's an alcoholic who lives on the street so we get that side of it and this is more in lincoln you know from lincoln's point of view it's not just established by the people around him um, there's also a newspaper journalist who's trying to 
you know pick up the pieces that Lincoln's left behind and, and have this great scoop of the story and everyone she talks to still talks to Lincoln very fondly you know he's still a loved man he you know he was the talk of the town he was the social hub everyone wanted to be a, you know seen with him to socialize with him he bedded all the eligible women um you know so he still has a very positive um reception in you know in the vacuum that he's left behind apart from these treasury guys to get more and more violence in, there, in what they'd like to do to him and then it goes off in in several different directions one of which i don't want to spoil but was shockingly brilliant because you realize that this is a book again a critic critique of capitalism because in part one they try they try to get down to the core of why why he is such a winning personality why he clo you know why he can make persuade anyone to do anything and it, and it comes up with this sort of theory about uh, scone kick which is you have to tell lies and it's part of the game and uh, you know everyone knows that that they're being lied to but they accept it because that's how business gets done and stuff and it seems this is very much tied in with Lincoln himself the shock I don't I don't want to talk about the shocking but it was it was brilliant but then it's left of a bit of a cliffhanger and you don't know if it really happened or not if it's all inside his head as he looks to take down or do a symbolic act to take down capitalism and then we go into again we go into different things and a sort of more or a, a less fictional aspect which is the story about uh, water and the privatization of water in America and how Chicago was resisting that whereas I can't remember which country was it Dominica I can't I can't remember which country but anyway they they did privatize their water and it had catastrophic uh, uh, consequences and the story that that um, Dara tells here and I must look up to see if the guy was was a real life person this is a real life campaign so he's an ardent uh, you know environmentalist arguing against the privatization of water and then he changes sides then he becomes an ardent sort of pro privatizer and is actually employed on the books of um of a a, a company that, that want to buy up the rights to to distribute water and everyone is shocked and appalled and i think there's an echo of him to what lincoln does um but then he um sets up a sting in which he is the person being stung he records him giving money to uh, local councillors to to agree to to water privatization and he sort of exposes himself and he says that he did that deliberately that he you know this is the only tactic he could use to stop privatization of water to show how corrupt and venal it was um, people aren't sure you know people are, are very split in the book as to whether that that's true or not but it's a really interesting and as I say I must look up and see if it's a real life thing but I think it definitely has echoes with with Lincoln the only other thing I want to say is it is quite experimental in form. There are blank pages to signify the breaks uh, between sections. There's lots of, as I say, uh, non-attributed uh, dialogue. Uh, but even unlike Gaddis, who doesn't really do experimental things at the level of the dialogic sentence, Dara does. There are pages of quite sort of stream of consciousness uh, page after page after page and the only reason I don't give this five stars is because I couldn't quite see how again how all the bits joined up together I wasn't sure if the whole book was always referring back to Lincoln Selwyn or not um, so I give it four and a half stars because it was terrific but I was just left slightly off balance at the end by not quite knowing ultimately where the book was pitching itself in terms of plot and resolution books don't have to resolve anything by the end but I couldn't quite knit all the pieces together so there you have it that's my reading uh, last couple of weeks uh, till next time thanks very much